disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, founders, builders, professionals. Welcome to the Thinking on Paper book club, your personal guide to the strategies, frameworks and insights from books that can actually change your life. And that sounds like grandiose hype, but they can change how you think vis-a-vis, they can change your life. We're reading Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish, founder of the Farnham Street blog, the Knowledge Project podcast. Part three, part of taking command of your life is controlling the things you can. Another part is managing the things you can't, your vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Jeremy, part three, tell us about it. So we went, so the first two parts that we've read are about acknowledging uh, these defaults that we have as, as, as humans, it's human nature, it's defaults, it's, it's ego, it's societal, a few others that inertia default, right? A bunch of them that, that, you know, I think we landed on the fact that, you know, these aren't manufacturing defects. They're just things that you need to, to manage, right. As a, as a, you know, as a default mode, right. Um, Biologically part of us. Totally. Yeah, exactly. So as we get into part three, uh, a couple things that, that were pretty interesting as he talks about just the idea of um, little things together accumulating to uh, influence larger change, right? So I look at it like he talks about programming new subroutines, right? So if you want to make a big change, you don't just try to make the big change and swing for the fences. You got to change little things that change your habits that um, that turn those little behaviors into bigger change. And on the flip side of that, he listed failure as a series of small errors consistently repeated. Right. Yeah. So where my head always goes, Mark, you've heard me talk about this a lot is as a as a lacrosse coach, you know, of various age groups. Yeah. you know, middle school kids, elementary school kids, high school kids, and telling them, you know, about how little decisions create habits and habits create outcomes and that and that sort of thing. So that's where my head went to uh, initially on this. And, and, and I'm a big believer in, in what he's saying. Yeah. And, he, and so he goes through that. And then he outlines kind of some strategies safeguards environmental changes that you can manage your your biological weaknesses doesn't he um maybe we could start with the the strategies for weaknesses so um there are two ways to manage your weaknesses he says the first is to build your strengths which help you to overcome the weaknesses you've acquired the second is to implement safeguards, which will help you manage any weaknesses you're having trouble overcoming with strength alone. Um, All right, swinging the bat back at you, Mark. What is what is one of your weaknesses, and what is one of your strengths that that you know help you overpower that weakness? One of my weaknesses. Do you know what? One of my weaknesses is obviously not listening to. The, my inner voice because I kind of knew you were going to ask me that and I didn't actually prepare an answer even though I kind of Jeremy's going to ask me what my weaknesses are okay at the moment my weakness is let's continue from our show yesterday with Dr. Larry Rosen okay my weakness is what a great show by the way that episode was cr incredible incredible show and since we were talking about how our brain is manipulated by technology let's say one of my weaknesses is focus and concentration so i'm uh, to combat that taking some advice from clear thinking building my environment to remove those distractions to help me focus so i'm using this my environment to battle my weakness mm, i like that i like that. that that makes a lot of sense and in environments this is this is he talks about um you know environments as well so like if you set up your environment if you're trying to eat healthier right yeah. if if i'm trying to eat better and you know i've got i've got you know kids in elementary school and middle school and high school and cereal is a part of that equation right so cereal and snacks and all of that kind of stuff easy grab and go stuff 
it's harder for me to eat healthier if that stuff is there because my default mode is like, I want to, it's right there. I'm going to eat it. And then also here's the interesting thing he talks about too. Bad habits are easy, easier to justify when there's a delay between action and consequence. Yeah, that was fascinating. I wrote that down. So if I eat a bowl of cereal tonight, like, am I going to be 400 pounds tomorrow? No, but like death of a thousand, death by a thousand cuts kind of thing is, is really, it's easy to justify the bowl of cereal. Because we go, I'll, I'll go for a run tomorrow or I'll have some carrots the next day or whatever. It's really interesting how the brain works. Yeah, that, that compounding of small bad decisions builds up but you don't notice it yeah the feedback you don't you, the, the feedback is a long way into the future you, you have too much to drink the you don't get the feedback until later on the same with the food so um we're so back just what i do with my environment um clutter clutter uh, messy desk messy mind so clear space lots of light i remove what my phone's in a different room it's not near to me like friction I'm, I'm adding friction like you you know you if you remove all your cookies from your cupboard and you have to go to the shop to get your cookies yeah you may sod it i won't have them but you know if they're in a the cupboard you're gonna get them so remove that friction what's your weakness and how do you compensate for that cereal cereal is cereal. my weakness cereal is my weakness um <laughs> No, that's it. That's it. That's a good question. You are, I, you are in America. You probably have some pretty weird cereals over there, like uh, European cereals. It's all brand. It's healthy. Well, the, there are all brand. Nice. <laughs> um, no, seriously. One of the one of the things I'm actually working on right now is one of my weaknesses is being able to uh, delegate better. Oh yeah, good. One. And you know I you know, back to the, you know, pointing back to this lacrosse example, right? So I have, I'm building, I built a lacrosse organization, youth lacrosse organization, essentially from scratch and was kind of the guy doing all the things. And now we've gotten to a point where the numbers are, are such that I can't do all of the things anymore. So now I've got some great parents that have come in and that sort of thing, but there is that balance of trying, you know, I want it to be a certain way, you know, and I want the culture to be a certain way, but I also want to let people, you know, be able to breathe and make it their own too. So um, I'm not sure how, how I'm handling that weakness yet. And if my environment can help with that weakness. But so from the book, knowing about your blind spots isn't enough. And one of the things about what we're doing book club is to be accountable and, you know, knowing the path and walking the path, they're not the same thing. So now you're walking the path before perhaps you knew it. Now you're walking it. And that in itself is taking control. Well, here's, here's it. I'm, I'm just thinking, cause I had this written down too. And maybe now that, you know, this is, and this is the brilliance of, of a book club because, you know, not that our club is brilliant, but the idea that we read stuff and we talk to each Hell other yes, about it, it. maybe it is brilliant. Maybe it is brilliant. Um, that's another weakness, not tuning yeah. my own horn. Right. Um, no, but like, think about this, like, so productive discourse, I had this written as productive discourse. So, um, in my interaction with the, the people that helped me with this lacrosse organization, you know, I might start implementing this, this, this series of steps. So when I see something that I would like to be a little bit different in the delivery of, you know, whatever is happening, share an observation. Hey guys, I'm seeing X, Y, Z. What, what else, what am I missing? And I think that's really cool. And then shut up and listen, right? Like really shut up and listen, you know, just share an observation, ask if I've missed anything, listen, and then ask what else I've missed. I think that that could be really interesting to test in, in a lot of different environments instead of saying, Hey, I need this to be X, Y, Z do it. It's more, Hey, I'm seeing, you know, this kind of thing. What am I missing from your perspective? Well, we're doing it this way because, Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Right. Um, so I don't know, that might be a way to, to, to improve upon a weakness using one of his frameworks. I think that would be awesome. Yeah. Shifting perspective. And I like the way that, you you mirror what he said not just asking it once it's like what else did i miss and i, I i'm gonna i'm gonna do the same so i'm sure um this week i've got some situations some meetings where i'm going to be in need of other people's perspectives so i'm going to use that and i'll let you know next week how it goes i'll do the um, same i'll do the same yeah i think i think that's really cool um 
One other thing we were talking about a second ago that um, that was interesting. Okay, here's another Rush analogy. If you guys have been listening uh, over the uh, – or another Rush reference, the you know nerd rock band, Canadian guys that I love. Um, Show Don't Tell. Show Don't Tell is a Rush song. It's a great one. Um, but there, there was this, uh, I think it was an Admiral, uh, Abrashoff, Abrashoff yeah. that was trying to change the culture of this ship that, that was just, the culture was terrible for years and years and no one knew why. And your know, ship was brand new. It was brilliant. It was, you know, had trained people on it. But what he did was, you know, there was a hierarchy of these officers, right? And the officers always got to eat first, no matter what. So the, it instantly created this haves and have nots. And what he did was got in the back of the line and then the officers were like, no, you can go to the front of the line. He goes, nope, I'm good right here. And that's all he did. And it was action, right? It was showing the culture he wanted to uh, change in there and not telling people what was up. I thought that was a really cool example. Very powerful. And it's one of those, when I was reading that, I could Im imagine a scene from a film with, with the emotional music and the the new captain of this big destroyer going to war and he's you know i'm just gonna i'm gonna be with my men like stand at the back of the queue not not dividing us and them like you say um halt do you remember who the goes halt? there halt who goes there so the chat part three is about weaknesses and mistakes and then strategies he uses to combat those one was the acronym halt do you remember what that stood for right off the top of my head i don't um remind me i remember it it's one it's the one that uh organizations like alcoholics anonymous use right as their as their kind of procedure exactly hungry yep. angry lonely tired don't make a decision if you are hungry angry lonely or tired um, because the, you're probably going to make the, the wrong decision. So every time you're faced with a, a decision, a big decision, ask yourself if you're hungry, ask yourself if you're angry, lonely or tired. And then if the answer to any of those is honestly yes, then find a way to postpone making the decision. And one of the ways that we seem to be talking about this quite a lot recently, but one of the ways that he outlines to help with that is automatic rules again here we are again with with automatic rules um have you i, I know you spoke about that this last week have you added any more automatic rules since last week uh yeah so we we did talk about those and did i run run down like my decision matrix my energy matrix last week yes yeah i keep i keep the same i keep the same ones in place and i always have uh or not always have but over the last i don't know probably seven or eight years and largely they're, they, they, they really work. They really work, especially when someone asks me to do something and I'm like, well, do I need to, do I need to do this? Am I, it, does this help me in my ability to teach people? Does this keep me smiling? Right. Does this provide stability and opportunity for my family? Does it, am I building cool things with cool people? Right. And, and, you know, it's not as easy, like we talked about with, uh, with, um, uh, who's the gentleman on our the psychologist um on our last show this week larry rosen larry rosen we talked with we talked with him about you know this this idea that uh you know having having this finite amount of energy and being able to direct it but not having it as quantified as we would like it so it's not it, it's not this super mathematical matrix it's more of this oh this kind of keeps me keeps me between the lines of the road when i'm driving you know like that uh, analogy what are, what are your rules what do you, i know you we talked about your some of your automatic rules no we both have these no meetings before lunch if we uh, can help it yeah like i was thinking of some um I, again after the show with larry rosen maybe incorporating some more automatic rules regarding my use of technology hmm. um and my phone notifications so i'm still thinking about what those new rules might be maybe no no social media no linkedin in the morning or it may be like i do my social media between four and five at the end of my day perhaps i don't, I don't know i need to define what those are 
one of the things I did like about kind of an automatic rule, but he he has this really good way to bring out the best in him during this chapter. And he speaks about imagining always having a film crew with him. And I thought this was really powerful because he, he says that any time he's in a situation, a new situation, a familiar situation, he imagines having a film crew with him, filming like the Shane Parrish show. OK, so now it's the Mark Fielding show. And there's this film crew with me. It's a reality TV show. And when you obviously, if you were on a reality, if you're on your own TV show, you'd want to be the best version of yourself for the world, for your family, for your friends, wouldn't you? And so Sounds exhausting. The idea of having like, like this film crew following you around to, you know, I want to make the best decision because the world's watching. I thought that was a pretty, pretty useful um, tool to... You know what's interesting about that? It, it it ties into one of our default modes, our ego default mode, right? Because it's like, oh yeah, I don't want to look like a Yahoo, right? So it's not <laughs> right. So so it that is in that is connecting to something that is innate in our nature, and and you know that is a, a thought experiment that would work because it's connected to a default mode. Um, so that's yeah, it sounds exhausting. It sounds terribly yeah. exhausting. Maybe a reality TV show like <clears throat> isn't the best. TV show, maybe some kind of documentary about clear thinking. Yeah, a lot of a lot of side camera shoots. You know, not looking direct, directly into the lens. A lot of pensive background shots. Right. Yeah. Um, well, no. we, couple, the other last week we spoke about our invisible board of directors, and if, if you missed last week's episode, check it out wherever you're watching this or listening to this. And we want to um, hear yours. Who's who? Are, who's on your board of directors? Right. So it's it pass, It's like that, isn't it? Like rather than imagining you had a film crew with you all your time, it's like what would what would Epictetus do in this situation, or what would Gary Lineker do, or what would you know Quentin Tarantino do in this situation? Yeah. Epictetus would look at you, Mark, and go, "Hey, tighten up, dude." What you know, are you talking about right? Life is life is hard, buddy. No, um, <laughs> here going back to this this idea of uh, automatic rules and. Um, the, the one thing that jumped or one of the things that jumped out in this chapter is, you know, here's the quote. I was giving one of the most important things I wanted to do the worst of myself. Yeah, great. Quote. And that is like it's so important because we have we have a certain amount of energy, creative energy, cognitive energy, whatever it is. Right. And I see that like if I want to do something that's really meaningful, that requires a lot of thought, um, you know, I need some space to do that. in, Right. And I'm not going to do that. It's, you know, 8 p.m. after lacrosse practice. I'm going to do that, you know, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning where my cognitive load is the lightest. Right. I haven't been bombarded with with stuff yet. And I think that's really important. And a lot of times we get pulled into things that that seem easier. Right. So this points back to another book I read a long time ago called The War of Art, which is like such an awesome, uh, such an awesome uh a book, but he references this force called uh, resistance, which is the 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 act of easier things or seemingly easier things that pull you away from the important things. So if I'm sitting here writing, you know, I'm 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 writing something, an article, or just journaling, or whatever, and I have my phone over here, I'm like, oh, I can just quick check. I need to quick check something, right? Checking my phone is easier than capturing my thoughts on paper, right? Yeah. Um, so there is this force of resistance and you got to manage it because it's always there. It's always going to be there. But you got to give your put yourself in the best position where your cognitive load is the lightest, ensures um, success as much as you can. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I want to be distracted. Sometimes you want it's like, oh my, I, I, this is actually what I'm doing is it's 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 too demanding. I, I actually I want to be distracted and maybe um he speaks about making the 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 deserved behavior the default behavior and maybe there's some way to to incorporate those two ideas and not want to be distracted by the easier path but to make the difficult path the default and therefore not wishing to be distracted from it well, distraction. <laughs> hey, distraction is OK, too, man. Like, because, you know, I don't want to come from this position of like we have to be hyper efficient machines and always being creative and always producing. I mean, man, at the end of the day, you know, there's nothing more that I love doing is, you know, plopping on a couch, hanging out with uh, hanging out with my wife and watching a, an episode of Fargo and having a, you know, having a beer or something like, you know, sometimes I just want to just stare at something and not 
you know, not use my brain, right? So it, have you seen the new season of Fargo? It's I've we, yeah, we went through all of them, right? We went through season, we just finished season five and it was like, whoo, Don Draper is a whole new dude in this show, right? Well, I'm only like a few episodes into season five, but I, I quit and I went back, tried it, loved it. But anyway. Yep, yep. Fargo. We go, um, let me ask you this. So, well, here's, here's another thing that another quote that I found really interesting, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. So if you want to see whether your thinking is wrong, make it visible. What does that make you? What does that make you feel? Well, again, so on our show this week with Larry Rosen, when he, 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 he's speaking about our addiction to technologies and one of the ways that you can override that addiction is on your phone you have this option where you can see how long you've spent looking at your phone and nobody does that because everyone is afraid of looking at their phone and go, oh my god i've spent 17 hours in the last two days on social media and youtube and you feel bad so mm -hmm. i think it corresponds to that it, um, it, it forces you to acknowledge <laughs> what you are doing right or what you're doing wrong so uh, again a struggle for your ego default right yeah you know but that's something that you know you you can push up against and and become more comfortable in in those moments but you gotta you gotta do it right you gotta you gotta see that and and feel that uncomfortableness and move through it kind of if it can be measured it can be improved <laughs> Absolutely. And so, so I look at that I, I, immediately, I think, you know, think about, you know, what I do in, in this right to know you program, where we have a theory that, you know, writing turns thoughts into objects. And when they're objects, you can look at them from a more neutral perspective, right? If they're in your head, they're yours. It's like, in, and it's you, right? But if that thought is written on paper, it's an object, you can come back to it and be like, huh, that's interesting, you know, and, and I wonder why I was thinking that way. Right. And it helps, helps make them not you. Right. And it helps, helps, uh, manage that default. I think. I agree. And so if anyone watching this, write down your thoughts, come back to them and then take on your weaknesses and your strengths with the strategy of clear thinking. Um, awesome. So as good a place as any to leave part three, we uh, have part four, which is a very long part. So next week's show will be a bit longer. Previous books in the book club, The Design of Everyday Things by non Don Norman. You can see that on YouTube. And before that, we read Nexus, The New Convergence of Arc, Technology and Science. Still one of my favorites. Yep, yeah, thinking on paper to XYZ. You can listen on Spotify, YouTube. Join us um jeremy anything you'd like to leave us with to think on uh be curious stay disruptive keep thinking on paper bye <laughs>